The windward side of Oahu is flanked by the majestic Ko'olau Mountains and engulfed in verdant greenery. While in the distance the town of Kaneohe bustles with life, many of the valleys are silent and tranquil. Graced with an untamed sweeping coastline, the overall composition stirs creativity in unique ways. Ko'olau Ranch is in, indeed a nice and beautiful prominent part of the windward side of this island and uh, as far as my involvement and our family's involvement with this area um, the ahupua of Kualoa was uh, owned by the king as was all the other land in Hawaii and uh, in, in uh, the time of the great Mahele the uh, king split all the land into a number of different uh, different uh, areas and land divisions and, and therefore subsequently ownership. Some of it he kept for himself, some of it was crown land, some he gave to the chiefs, some he gave to the maka'ainana or the common people. Uh, the ahupua of Kualoa was, uh, was his own personal land and um, uh, in 1850 he sold it to Garrett P. Judd who was uh, my great 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 grandfather. And, uh, that started the, the current history of Kuhaloa Ranch and everything that has, uh, has happened since 1850. So basically since that time it's been uh, primarily an agricultural operation from a land use perspective. It still is primarily an ag agricultural operation. Uh, since that time, reading through diaries of Garrett P. Judd and, uh, and other things, uh, they tried squash and potatoes and taro and uh, rice and, uh, and all kinds of different things. Uh, his son, Charles Hastings Judd, bought the neighboring two ahupua'a of Hakipu and Ka'a'ava at, uh, before the turn of the century. But uh, that's how Kualoa Ranch came to be the size and, uh, and the nature as it is right now, is uh, through Garrett P. Judd and Charles Hastings Judd. As I said, there was all kinds of different agricultural enterprises that were tried and some failed and some just passed on. Sugar was one uh, that, that uh, was a short-lived thing. The first sugar mill on Oahu, as most people know, was built at Kualoa. Uh, it was uh, a real rough business. It was started by Samuel Wilder, who was uh, Charles Hastings' Judd brother-in-law. Uh, Wilder is another uh, recognized name in Hawaii. Uh, after just uh, growing sugar for a few years in the Kualoa area, it was a time of a drought and the uh, production was not very, very high at that time. Uh, I think they, they ground about 300 tons a year uh, during their, their, their span of production. Uh, sugar plantations nowadays do that in a day. And so that's a relative, you know, relative to the uh, time and the technology and all of that. But it puts things in perspective. Um, one of the uh, things that kind of uh, broke the, uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was when Samuel Wilder's young son was walking across a vat of uh, boiling massaquit or what's uh, sugar juice. This is one of the processes they have. He was walking across a plank on top of this and another guy was coming the other way and um, he stepped on the side to, to let the boy pass or the boy stepped on the side to let the other guy pass and he was uh, bumped and he fell into this thing. And uh, he was 12 years old, I think. Uh, his name was Willie Wilder. And uh, he, after uh, some severe burns and everything and a courageous effort to, to keep his chin up, he died. And uh, that was the, the thing that after a long struggle uh, helped contribute to shutting down the whole operation. The education program at the ranch started about five years ago. And 
We started that because we felt that there was a need in the community for a farm experience and an agricultural experience for school children. And also it came about the time that uh, many teachers started calling the ranch and asking, gee, can we bring our kids out? Right now we have about a thousand school children a month that come out and visit the ranch. And they come Monday through Friday. Um, we average about 75 kids a day, 50 to 75 kids a day, and they come out. We have a hands-on petting zoo where they get to feed and touch a variety of uh, farm animals, goats and sheep and pigs, ducks and chickens. And we have heavy draft horses, quarter horses, ponies, donkeys. And we have also an exhibit, and our farm animal exhibit is uh, partly made up of some of the animals that came from Meadow Gold Dairy when they shut down their education program and were carrying on their tradition as well as our own uh, with the help of, of some new animals. So we have monkeys, spider monkeys as well. And usually the kids go in and they get to feed and touch all the animals and then they also go on a horse-drawn trolley ride or a tractor-drawn trolley ride depending on how much mud and rain we have on our road. It is a real unique experience for most kids. Um, I'm amazed at the number of children that never get to get their feet dirty. And so that's one of their biggest stumbling blocks is walking across a pasture most of the time. So they seem to enjoy themselves. We have a big picnic area. So they spend about two and a half to three hours at the ranch in the morning. Um, we teach them about cattle ranching and the history of Kualoa Ranch. And we talk about cowboys and what kinds of tools they need to get their job done. We talk about diversification in order to survive in the cattle business and we educate the public as well as educating these kids because there are a lot of people that drive by Kualoa Ranch and they only see what's most visible and most of the time the cattle are in the valley so they don't see cattle they see the recreation. So this way the public also gets educated on why we do all these things. My name is Abraham Akao. I work here for Mr. Morgan on Kulo Ranch, and uh, I've been here for about going 37 years now, and uh, I like it, what I do, and uh, it's interesting what we have to do on the ranch. Yes, uh, a lot of things we have to diversify. For me, it was hard at the beginning because I, I was here from, from the start, you know, almost the start of the ranch, and diversifying was, uh, was hard, but now I understand that we we need to diversify. I appreciate that uh, my daughter was born here. One of my daughters was born here on the ranch. And uh, I have another daughter. She, she managed the ranch now here with uh, John Morgan. And she's, uh, she's doing very well. And uh, I thank her for all the opportunities that, that we have here on the ranch. Uh, sometimes in the future we look, there's uh, what future do we have? But uh, I appreciate for what I've learned here, and then the, the, um, the Morgan family has been really nice to me and my family, taking care of us, and uh, it's wonderful. As I say, I think we're fortunate uh, that we can, we can uh, receive this place the way it is today because of the attitudes of the people in the past and, uh, and present about what to do with this place. The, uh, the interest has never been only on how to maximize the bottom line profit, and uh, that's how bad land use decisions are made. Um, and we still maintain that, and we're very, very concerned about the future of it and everything, and so we want to keep it this way. So that's why we've gone into the recreation, and that's why it has worked for us, so we want to continue that. And we, we want to continue where it's applicable to, to, uh, to do this kind of thing, where we integrate recreation with uh, with agriculture and open space because it really works for us and it's uh and it's something that we see as continuing people get to get out into the nature which is good for people you know nature is good for people and it's uh it is something that we see as uh as beneficial to both our company and to the community as a whole and so we want to continue doing that Working with the halal, you know, and, and just the interpretation of the word halal, we have ha and lau, and so properly translated, it means continuity of knowledge, continuity of tradition, and so the halal as a whole 
as a whole, excuse me, and um, all the kumuhula have a very important task, whether they realize it or not, and that is for the continuation of knowledge and tradition. And I <clears throat> do my teaching of knowledge and tradition uh, in a very particular way, I think, I think unlike any other halal, and that is through my music, through being able to compose and being able to take these traditions and put them in the music and then teach them through the dance. So they're, lear they're learning Hawaiian, you know, the language, the olelo, through learning the words of the song. Then they're learning the tradition through its interpretation. And again, extended one more time through the dance. The third thing comes when they actually begin to practice these traditions. I feel that the more they hear the words, the more they do the extension, which is a dance, the more they'll really practice it and apply it to situations at home or at work or wherever they may be applying. I think, well, when, when I look at music today and composing music and uh, listening to other songs, new songs that are being written, um, I often wonder if people have been really, really trained in proper poetry. Um, when you write a song, you know, the term that's used is called hakumele. And the word haku comes from hakule, which is to, to weave a lei. Yeah? And so, just like weaving a lei, you know, you want your lei to be beautiful. So you look for the choicest flowers that you can find, and you take them, you put them together, and very carefully, you begin to weave this lei. It's the same with writing music, or writing a song, or writing a poetry. In our language, there are many, many words and for one single word, there may be many meanings. And again, there may be many words that have single meanings. Um, so in writing your music, you have to be aware of all of this and also the symbolism of certain words and the allusions of certain words and the proper use of metaphor in your poetry. And again, aware of all of this, you take these words like these beautiful flowers you would be weaving a lay with, and you weave the poetry for that song. Today when I listen to some of the new music, I ask myself, gee, I wonder how much training this particular person had. Because it seems as though sometimes it's a literal translation of an English poem, and not too much thought was given to proper Hawaiian context. I like to think, you know, as far as I am concerned, when I write music, that uh, my music is uh, spirit-inspired music. And I say that because uh, many times people ask me to give a lecture on composing Hawaiian music, and I really cannot say exactly how to do it. All I can say is that when I'm in the mood, the music will come to me. And I'll pick up this ukulele. This ukulele is maybe about eight years old. You can see all the tape here that I'm holding it together with. There's a big crack, you know. Here it is right here. But I've composed all of my music on this ukulele. And what is funny about the whole thing is that I don't even know how to tune my ukulele. So if it's not tuned, somebody has to, I have to call somebody and they tune it for me. And then, you know, I'll work on my music. And of course, I like to think the final product is a good product. You know, filled with these metaphors, illusion, and kauna, the hidden meaning of the song in my compositions. And this song that I'm gonna do for you is my first composition. And it talks about the rain. And you know, I hear people today saying things like, oh, it's raining again. Oh, what a junk day. This is an awful day, it's raining. 
And I think to myself, how could they say such a thing, you know? Don't they realize the rain is a symbol of life? It tells you then that we need water. And here we have this, you know, eight islands that need to exist on all the water. So the rain falls and people get all irritated. Here comes the rain, oh, it's gonna spoil my day. But imagine if there was a drought now. They wanna talk about spoiling their day. I really think they should think twice about saying things like that because I believe in my heart that one day that great spirit will say, all right, you don't want the rain to stop all the rain. And then what? So I thought if one person, mainly me, would write a nice song about the rain and try to sing it as often as I could, then I could, you know, kind of block the message, the negative message that the rain is no good when the rain is really, really good. All right, so I wrote this song called Kavai Lehua Ala Kahunua. This particular verse is uh, really talking about the cycle of the way we get rain, you know. Water from the ocean is evaporated up into the sky. Then they form the rain clouds. The rain falls down to the earth or to our islands, filtered back through the land, goes into the ocean again. And then the whole process is repeated. And what we're doing here is forming a lei. The lei is, of course, symbol of, of the word aloha, but uh, also a symbol of life, right? The encirclement, you know, the beginning and the end, that's what he's talking about. And that, all of that, again, through the use of uh, symbolic words, allusion and metaphor, is written in that one verse. And this is where I say that that this is a song for you, my heavenly one. And I'm speaking about the rain. Kavai lehua, it's a lehua waters, ala kahonua, that uh, fragrant in the land. Nice, yeah? See, I paint from nature. I don't, I don't uh, rely on myself to imitate nature and create pictures that I call great pictures. I can't do that because nature is more surprising than, than the person. Uh, I, I, people wonder what, how I paint. Well, I don't look for a subject. I don't care whether it's a house or a tree or the ocean or whatever it is. I look for patterns of light. And these patterns are more important than the subject. They, 
make the difference whether it's a beautiful picture or just ordinary. So I sit by the ocean with my, I put up my easel and I get out my palettes and put the paint on the palette. And then I sit and I watch the ocean. I watch for something that happens. It'll happen, something will happen. The waves will cross us. When something happens that, that says, now that's a picture. I register, where is the lights? As I said, it happens very fast, it's gone. I put down where the lights were. What the, where there was light here, there was a light here, and a light in the sky, and the, the arrangement of those lights in a triangle or a, in, in some arrangement where they're interesting. So I take the white and I boom, 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 and I put those three spots right down. And in relation to those three spots, there were some darks. So I put where are the darks? I don't care what. I don't care what the subject is, it's where is the light and where are the darks. And those things produce what we call a composition. I always say, well now, if you paint a picture, I don't, everybody does this. They think the hand of God goes down their coat sleeves and does something. And they think, well, I can't touch this. Well, it's always, it's pretty bad. Uh, they don't touch it. They say, oh, I did this, I'm an artist. If they would look at their picture and notice whether or not it was described the beauty that they were painting. See, the beauty is always out there. It's not on the picture. If you want to find the beauty that I paint, uh, look at what I'm painting. Don't look at the picture. That's the real beauty. I'm trying to describe it. So that's all I do. I just describe what I find is beautiful. I got in painting, I got into painting as a, 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 by accident. I was a sculptor, which I also got into by accident. Uh, in the first, I, to begin with, I had an accident in 1935. I broke my neck and back the fifth and sixth cervical and fourth lumbar. And I didn't walk without crutches for three years. And I was partly paralyzed. So the hospital gave me some clay, soft plasticine. It's clay that is softened with oil instead of water. And it doesn't dry out. So I started doing ashtrays. Now, just about two days I did ashtrays. And then I started doing caricatures of the nurses and uh, the other patients and visitors and friends and whoever was around. And I did little portraits every day, sometimes two or three. And I got sort of interested. I, I realized that I could do pretty good little heads. And I practiced doing little heads until I could do bed of heads. And after three years of playing around with these little heads, and I learned to cast them in plaster and to make molds and, and so on. And I went to New York and became a portrait sculptor. When my students would come to me, and, and I used to do tricks to get students, um, I always explained to them that I never took any lessons. And uh, when people, uh, I, I just go and paint things that I find beautiful. Uh, and I always ask them why they want to study with me. Well, they think that painting with a student, with a professor or somebody, that's helpful. That they don't paint better than me. Well, what they do is copy the teacher. And what they do, what they learn to do, is to depend on the teacher to tell them what they, that, that, what's wrong. And the thing that always bothered me is that they don't pay attention to these lights. Where are the lights and where are the darks? They don't, they don't balance. And I always explain that after they take lessons, they're going to be able to copy the teacher. 
not very well, but they'll copy the teaching. And from then on, they won't be able to find their own mistakes. They depend on somebody to tell them what's wrong. Teaching helps the teacher. It gives him an, some kind of an income. The, a lot of people teach who can't paint, but that's all right. They get an income. And there are lots of people who like to be artists because they uh, like to look like artists. They like to be seen out there with an easel paintings. And uh, they like to talk art. Talking art is sort of a habit. They have to talk about it. why it's beautiful. I don't think art is for talking about. It's for looking at. And it's for enjoying, if you enjoy compositions, and the compositions are interesting, and, and you respond to them, then you enjoy them. And that is the function of art. The conversation of art is for critics, and I don't like critics. It is, I don't care. I don't think they know much about art. There, there a lot of, um, a lot of nonsense that you read, and you say, well, I don't understand this stuff on the canvas, these abstractions. Uh, well, I don't like abstractions. But there is sometimes, sometimes you'll see something that's good composition. Whether the artist did it by accident or not, you'll never know because uh, he takes paint and slobs it on the canvas. And if the composition is very good, well, he'll take that off and say, well, this is odd. Well, he's seen some beauty in, in, the, in the arrangement of light and dark. That's the only beauty there is. The art is like uh, playing baseball. I hit quite a few home runs, but uh, not the whole time.